So that requires a bit of patience if you haven't tried that in a car, doesn't it? Now obviously quite a number of people in the car were getting quite impatient, but I thought it was quite good because it was triggering them as well. <laughs> so what I did is that every time he just screamed more, I would say, Luca, screaming is not going to get love from mummy. Right? You were, you, know, you were trying to manipulate your mummy. Now he's only three years of age, but he can feel the emotion coming at me from me about those statements. And I just kept saying that, and then I would say to Thea, Fiona, you don't like men. I just kept saying that for that time. Right? So that drives people nuts, doesn't it? You can understand why people get driven nuts by me. What happened after an hour and a half of his rage? Because his rage was capping some really deep sadness that he's had in him from the time he's been conceived. And what happened was he stepped out of the rage and he went into this really deep, heartfelt sobbing of nobody loves me, sobbing. He just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And again, Fiona was very, very tempted to stop the car and, you know, give him a hug. And I said, no, no, let it keep going. You know, just let it keep going. Now, he did that for nearly 20 minutes. So, so we had an hour and a half of yelling and screaming, chucking things around, kicking the backs of chairs and he was also yelling at me because I was, seemed to be the main person who was driving all of it, so I got a lot of that as well. And he just allowed that, we just allowed that to continue, and then it went into this sadness. Now, he went into this place in his sadness, which was causal emotion, and it only took him 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, he released a lot of causal emotion about his mum not loving him. When he'd finished that, he stopped crying and he went into this real calm state. And he was just looking, he started smiling at everyone. And then he said to Mummy, Mummy, could I have a hug now? Right. Now, of course, that started triggering Mummy with regard to why she didn't want to love him. Right. And of course she wanted to hug him. So we stopped the car and she got out and hugged him. Right, right at that moment. Now, up until then, he was demanding it, wasn't he? But what happened is she was dealing with some of her emotions and he was dealing with some of his emotions. And his emotions were about not being loved, which were already had entered him by three years of age. And he was releasing some of that causal emotion. But Fiona was also starting to address some of her emotion as to why, why he didn't feel loved as well. And they got to a stage then where he felt loved. And so that, at that time we stopped at a service station. I went, his favourite food is strawberries, so I went and bought him some strawberries and gave him some strawberries, which are his strawberries. And he decided he wanted to share the strawberries, so we finished up eating strawberries. Now, he wasn't in a very sharing state before then. He was throwing a tantrum, screaming, yelling, really noisy. And the reason why is because he had these emotions being coming at him, which is, I'm not loved by money. And there was so much grief in him that he needed to connect to. Uh, and that process helped him to get to that. I was constantly reminding little Luca that he, that he wouldn't be able to demand love from mummy. But he would get love from mummy when he stopped demanding love from mummy. Does that make sense? And I kept reminding Fiona that, that unless she deals with the issues that she feels towards men, she would not be able to love her son, and he's going to continue to feel this emotion. So, so while in that particular instant, Luca released a lot of causal emotion about being unloved by mum, that doesn't mean that down the track he wouldn't feel that emotion, because mum needed to also release in her her anger towards men and then her sadness towards men. Does that make sense? Which she did not do completely while we were in the car. So that means that Luca at times still goes into these rages uh, because he feels so hurt about not being loved by mum. I might be doing better now. Sorry? They're doing better now because mum's, mum's just recently, we talk to them quite often, and mum's recently worked through quite a lot of emotions about men. And as a result of that, that's bound to affect her relationship with her, with her son. So that's an important thing to bear in mind. And there's lots of other examples I could give you, but what we'll do is probably, this is a natural place to have a break. Um, 
Is there any questions, though, before we go to the break? Because I just want to answer any questions about this denial process. Um, thanks, Lisa. Uh, is there a reason why one child would show you more than your other children? Like, they're all the same sex, like, they're all boys, but one in particular just shows me so much more. Yes. And there are lots of reasons why one child will show you more than the others. And it's not because that child's naughtier. So a lot of people are here saying, you know, that child's just naughty and the others are not. Yeah. And the reality is that each child has firstly their own personality. So each child's reaction to the same stimuli will be different. Secondly, because of the different times that the children came into our life, they also have different emotional conditions that are key emotional conditions. So for example, if your first child came to your life when you were 20, and you hadn't worked through hardly any of your causal emotion, then that child may finish up having a lot more damage in them than the child that comes into your life when you were 30 and you've worked through quite a lot of different emotions. Also, the child's gender will be a very uh, uh, much a determining factor. So if I'm a man and I have anger towards a woman, if I have a girl child, she is going to feel that more than, I'm fine, than if I have a boy child. And he obviously won't feel that, he'll feel that less but he may feel more the emotion of wanting to be angry with women, if that makes sense, because he's reflecting my emotion. So every single circumstance with our children is totally different. Even their ages are different. And uh, the times that they came into our life are different. What emotional injuries I had at the time they came into my life are completely different. And what emotional injuries my partner had at the time they came into our life is totally different. Can you see how there's so many variable factors that it's totally impossible for each child to act in the same way to the same stimuli. And that's the reason why one child will focus on particular lots of issues. You, you will find what will happen in your own progression is you'll deal with one child's focus of all their issues and then you might find another child has a hyper focus of different issues come up for them. And that'll be because you now work through the first issues and you now have the issues surrounding the child, the second child perhaps. Or, and it will be totally dependent upon the order will be totally uh, or seemingly random, uh, but it will be very dependent upon your own emotion. But, but uh, certain children might placate our injuries and other ones trigger us, which is essentially what you're saying. But um, if we then decide that one child is our favourite child and the other one isn't, then we add actually to their soul damage. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, this child was just born spiritual, or this child was just born this or that. Honestly, when you're saying things like that, you already have within yourself a lot of damaging emotions projected at the other children. And that's uh, very damaging to those children. So the key is to understand that even the most damaged child in our family, what we view as the most damaged child in the family, is actually a reflection of our own denial of emotion, or desire. And we'll talk about the dial of desire in a minute. Hey Joe, going back to the example of the knife. Yeah. If if both parents are in the room and the child is acting up with one of the parents, that is the parent that, that is the emotion from that parent, not necessarily from both? Yes. That's correct. The child will generally pick on the parent. <laughs> when I say pick on the parent, I mean focus their attention on the parent with the problem that they actually are feeling the emotion from. Yeah. So for example, another example that I gave, my, Michael and Fiona, are, we mentioned for you earlier, myself and then we're driving in a car in Barbados, little Luca was sitting right next to me, and he turns around to me and says, I hate you, AJ. And I said to uh, Michael Fee, which one of you hate me at the moment? <laughs> and Fee says, uh, I think it was me. <laughs> And then Mike says, uh, then Mike, uh, sorry, little Luca then says to Michael, Mike, Fiona's partner, and what was he saying? Oh, silly Mike, silly Mike, stupid Mike, silly Mike. And he just kept on that, this silly Mike, stupid Mike, like that. And Mike's going, oh boy, oh boy, like what's going on now? And he realised that this was a message, in fact, that he kept on getting from his mother that he felt, that he'd never connected to and felt inside of himself, inside of, so just straight away, 
this is what Luca was doing all day. So if you can imagine, he was perfect little tree. It was great to be with him because every single moment of every single day, he, he would go up to people in a group. So there people come to a group like this and he'd go, uh, this is little three-year-old child. He goes, You're, you hate your mother. And like, the person who was there is a 28, 29-year-old man and his mother is sitting right next to him. <laughs> and he says to her, hey, you hate your mother. And then he goes on to the next person, like, just like that, just one comment. And, and, he's, and the man's saying, no, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't, I don't, I don't hate you, or anything like that. But the truth is that there was this emotion in him where, of deep hatred towards mum because of some events in his childhood that mum allowed to occur. And uh, Luca was just constantly reflecting to every single person the emotion that they were feeling. So, you know, another time he'd just come up and belt somebody. So this, this sounds like an unruly child, doesn't it? And most people would condemn the child and say, oh, it's so unruly. You know? But in reality, he's perfect reflecting the emotion he feels from that particular person right at that moment. Right at that moment. So that's pretty confronting if we start looking at it that way, isn't it? Everything the child is doing right at that moment is a reflection of my interaction with that child emotionally. Okay. Hi, Jay. Um, when I got here, I just felt completely exhausted. Like I immediately felt like I dropped all my energy. And I'm feeling a bit like how on earth can I parent my children properly when I was a parent like, you know, I feel like it's hopeless. Yeah, so feel that emotion, you do need to feel that emotion. Many of us as parents do have this hopeless emotion that no matter what I do, I'm just not going to be able to do it well. Another reason though why your energy dropped is there is a whole group of spirits here today who are facing issues with regard to how they've treated their children while they're on earth. Do you follow me? And that they're hearing a lot of what I'm saying to them and feeling more and more depressed, feeling more and more overcome. And many of you are feeling that emotion too as we talk about some of these issues, feeling more and more depressed and overcome with, oh, wow, like, wow, when does the news get better sort of thing. And the truth is that what we need to do in this circumstance is really long to God, pray to God about dealing with these emotions and also asking for God's forgiveness, right? Getting into a repentant state as a parent. Repentance, remember, is what opens grace. Remember we've talked about this before. Grace from God, or if you could think of it as forgiveness from God, or when I say God automatically forgives, of course, but the feeling of love entering us, removing causal emotion, which is grace, when, when that, that will occur when we're in a repentant state. So if you feel bad as a parent, allow yourself to feel bad. Right? Don't shut yourself down and don't go into sleep mode and don't try to avoid it and run away from the issues. Just allow yourself to feel the emotion. And this applies to these spirits too. They need to allow themselves to feel, I was a bad parent, and direct that to God. And sure, most of us have got no idea how we become a bad parent. Do you know what I mean? Most of us have no idea how we even became a parent, aside from the sex act. <laughs> but aside from that, we've just got no idea right, what actually happened and why, you know, how we got these little children in our lives. And so most of us feel lots of confusion when it comes to parenting. <coughs> the key is to allow ourselves to feel those emotions. So don't shut those emotions down within you. When I first had to confront, obviously I have two sons, so when I first had to confront all of these emotions, I went through some fairly dark periods of my own progression. Just feeling my deep feelings of personal responsibility for what damage I've done with my boys. And I spent a lot of time talking to God about that. A lot of time talking to God to, to help, asking for God to illuminate within me the emotions within me that created these problems. Does that make sense? Allow yourself to do that. I guess I take a little bit of um, hope from the fact that I know I can't do it by myself. Yeah. And I forget that I don't have to. Exactly. Really good. Exactly. Yes. And then, see, this is this is the problem. A lot of times, we talk about a subject where we feel a lot of deep shame or we feel a lot of judgment at ourselves, and then we get into this state feeling like it's all hopeless, 
But in reality, actually, the opposite is the case. Now that we're facing the truth, it's the most hopeful that it can ever be. The time that it's actually hopeless is when we're not facing the truth and we're not wanting to look at the truth and, and see it, all the damage of what we've done in our lives. When we face the truth, that's the time when we get the most assistance from God. And that's the time too when you'll really feel a lot of love flowing through you from God if you connect to God in an instance. Right? So that's why it's very powerful for you as parents to go through these things. Well, she started talking a lot about um, how she felt towards him and how men had hurt her over her lives, her, over her life. So, so she didn't actually feel love towards her son. She just stopped feeling the anger towards her son. So what she did is instead of actually, instead of actually holding on to that rage inside of herself about men, she just started talking about the kinds of things, the kinds of things men had done to her throughout her life, starting from an uncle and a father and, and others, right the way through to where she was today, when we were in the car. And she just started describing those events and owning them, like owning them as actual memories and, fit, and allowing herself to even see that this is how she felt. She didn't actually process the underlying grief at all at that point. All she did was own them. And often you'll find the same, as soon as you own the emotion, the child's emotion will be reflected differently as soon as you own it. You don't necessarily have to feel it like to completion. Yeah. Does that make sense? But so she didn't finish processing the emotion. No, and, and what you were doing then as well was sort of un, unlearning, like Luca had learned something from the constant projection of this emotion at him all of the time and he'd learned a behaviour about how to manage that for himself. So. Mm -hmm. It wasn't only Fee's process, it was actually Luca's process as well. Yeah. He was needing to learn lessons about love that had been, he'd taken on some ideas about love that weren't truthful. And you, you know, everyone in the car was teaching him a, a truth. A truth about love. The truth about love is that you can't manipulate a person into loving you. And that's the truth that Luca had not learned because his mother had allowed manipulation of herself in order to, for him to get love from her. And so it was about breaking, remember I talked earlier about breaking a codependent link? And uh, that's what that particular situation was all about. In fact, I was more focused on Luca and trying to help Luca than I was on uh, fo focused on Fee in that particular instance. The reason why is that having a screaming child in the car for an hour and a half is pretty hard to put up with. <laughs> so uh, that often will become your focus because it's the one that makes a lot more, more noise. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the truth is that it was his mum's emotions that created that. But, but his response was to get into demanding situations with his mother in order to get love. And that had to be addressed as well. Uh, now, you know, how you address that, the best way to address that is for mum to start giving love. But unfortunately, even if mum began giving love wholeheartedly, what would happen to Luca is he would still have that injury because that injury entered him before birth. Yeah. Hey Jane, my youngest son um, has always been one of my biggest triggers. Yep. And um, speaking about how if you don't feel it, the child will feel the emotion, the child will show you. My son at about four or five was, he would go into great rage. Mm -hmm. And my emotion that I wasn't facing was my fear of angry men. Yeah. And once I started to recognise that I hadn't worked on it yet, but even just recognising it, yeah. he seemed to come. That's spot on. And yeah, it, that, that's exactly what Fee was feeling too. She was so afraid of angry men, she would do anything to make the anger stop. And so, so her son had actually learned that all he has to do to control money is get angry. 
and he's got money under his finger. And he literally did have money under his thumb. And, and the same goes with you. Yeah. yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Any other questions? We're going to have a break. Let's come back in about, I don't know, half an hour, 45, shall we? Fantastic. You liar. <laughs> <laughs> now, can, I was thinking perhaps uh, just like to hear some of your comments about what you've heard so far. It can be negative. And maybe Dennis, can I start with you? And then because the mic's close to you. And then... I, personally, I think you summed it all up in the, in the first sentence. If we'd have done all this with our soul instead of our mind in the first place, we wouldn't be all this where we are now. Yeah. It's just the realisation of all this. Yeah. yeah. Jen? It's all true. And um, it's just wonderful to finally release a lot of this. I just a lot um, of the guilt you feel about not doing it. Actually, it, it wasn't guilt. Yeah. Um, when the young lady down the front said something, and then you said to her, "You feel like you don't have enough time to process it, or you can't process process it quick enough." Yeah. Uh, my children and I, we are actually parting ways in two months' time and I didn't realise I had so much fear uh, of that because I thought if I'm not there I won't be able to help them yeah. and it brought up a lot. And I have seven other people living in the house and I saw so much pain in each and every one of their faces I didn't realise I had that much pain inside me yeah. because they're only reflecting how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's just wonderful. Thank you both very much. And I would like to say to Mary, what a change. You are just... Isn't she just... Looks like she belongs up there from last time? Yeah. So, congratulations. You must have done a lot of work as well. So, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your support, too. I feel it each and every day I'm here. Thank you. And Mary would probably like to say a few things to you about that because we had a chat in our break together. I, I've been sitting up here feel like feeling so useless. I had all of this stuff. I can't say anything because I'm not a parent. Oh, I want to say, oh, I can't say it. So, yeah, thank you. And I've been feeling, um, yeah, lots of stuff about oh, how do you be the other half of this soul? He's pretty amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any problem being with the other half of this side. This side is pretty good on things. We met Jeremy in the break and that was really awesome. Because he he um, he was just himself and he wasn't worried about what anyone thought and I went, I gotta I gotta take a leap out of Jeremy's book. So yeah. <laughs> Jeremy sort of Jeremy was gave your side, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jeremy came up to us and he was just being himself, you know, telling all of his stories and, you know, all that kind of thing. And, and Mary was just thinking, yeah, this is good for me. This is good for me. Yeah. <laughs> One of the problems that we uh, are working through together, myself and Mary, is um, just allowing ourselves to be ourselves with every single person around us. And Mary's uh, finding that quite difficult at times because she's sort of feels very, she's very sensitive to everyone's projection of emotion. So as soon as she feels like she needs to be somebody different than she is, then it gets a bit confusing inside, doesn't it? I feel like I'm going to be perfect up there, which is, I don't expect anything to be perfect, so it's a bit crazy that I feel like I have to be, but I do. You know, yeah. So Mary's doing the rest of the afternoon, <laughs> while, I have, while I have the rest. She said she needs that trigger. Did you say that? No. No? Well, you said that. No, it's just a matter of... It, it's the same, isn't it, with a lot of interactions. When you're under the spotlight, there's this tendency then to act differently. And it's good and 
by this feeling that nobody really is going to accept you as you really are. And that's a big childhood emotion, isn't it? That gets projected on us when we're children a lot. So, uh, so it's good to work through that emotion. But let's get back to one of the things we're going to do in future too is probably make an outline, but we're not going to actually ourselves uh, go by the outline. What we're going to do is give you the outline so that you have some notes to take away with you, and they just sort of be notes. And what we'll do is we'll just go through more of an interactive way with you, with, that, with the material. So from now on, in this afternoon, what we want to do is that. We want to go through this material in a really interactive way with you. So, the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about with you is the suppression of your desires as a parent. Do you know what I mean by that? Every single time that you suppress a desire in yourself, you're also teaching your child to suppress a desire within themselves. So let's get to uh, some of the desires that are really tricky desires in terms of most of us have some shame or guilt about, and that is our sexual desires. Every single time you suppress your sexual desires within yourself, you're also suppressing the sexuality of your child. Now, how many of us feel like we've got some major issues regarding sexuality in our lives? How many of you feel that? Like, like, like I've had lots to do with uh, through mine. And every single time we don't deal with those emotions and we actually suppress the desires that we have, we're influencing our child to do very, very similar things. What's the opposite of suppress, though? It's not actually to enact the desires either, is it? No, no, it's a matter of feeling them. So it's a matter of feeling the desires that you have. Some of the desires will be out of harmony with divine love. Some of them will be out of harmony with God's laws. But you still need to feel them. And you need to feel them to release them, to work on them. You need to feel them. So let's just give some examples. Um, let's say uh, there's, a, there's three or four children in the family. And uh, three of them are teenage girls now. There's the father and the mother. And the teenage girls are used to uh, nudity when they were young, and so they're still roaming through the house naked, and they're in their teens. And so Dad sees them naked, and he tells them, go and put clothes on. How does that sound to you? What comments do you want to make about it? Lisa? Sorry, 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 yes. It's like making them feel ashamed of just being naked. Yes, it is making them feel ashamed. Now, what must be going through the father to actually request that of them, do you think? What do you reckon, maybe? He's obviously feeling something for them sexually, so he doesn't want to deal with that. Exactly, exactly. Otherwise, he would not be uh, worried about it, would he? If he wasn't worried about it when they were five or ten, why would he be worried about it for 15? Yeah. Please. And what about the father walking around naked in front of the girls? Well, if he's done it all their life, why wouldn't he do it still? Like, in the end, God didn't design us with clothes on. <laughs> he designed us without clothes on. In our family, we all used to walk around naked, but every time I noticed with the kids, as soon as they got to their teens, there would be us and mum and dad to put their clothes on. Actually, that's true. Yes. Why would that be? What are the feelings that mum and dad have about their own bodies? If, if the child is reflecting shame back of, the, of a body back to the parent, what does the parent feel about their own body? Shame. Right. So you must have some shame about your own body. And you know you do. Does that make sense? And all they're doing is reflecting that back to you. That's all they're doing. So, uh, so I'm not suggesting you all need to now go strip off and be naked around everybody. What I'm saying is that if our behaviour changes due to age differences or whatever, we need to seriously look at the underlying emotions as parents. If our children's behaviour changes, like throughout any period of our lives, we need to look at our behaviour as parents. Our children are our law of attraction. Right? 
So what they are actually doing with us and saying to us and interacting with us with uh, it is the proof of what's within our soul, whether we want to believe it or not. It's there. And we need to allow ourselves to see it. Um, since, I've been, since my daughter was young, she's always buttoned me up and told me to put my clothes on. And, and I'm just wondering, is that because I'm in such denial? Because I don't feel that way? Yes. Yeah, so you're in denial of an emotion that you actually do feel inside of yourself, but you've intellectually skipped over it. We often do this as parents. What we do is we intellectually skip over the emotion, thinking we don't have it, or thinking we've accepted some new thought, when in reality we haven't dealt with the issue emotionally, and our children will perfectly reflect back to us the fact that we haven't dealt with the issue emotionally. Yeah. So whenever a child does that with you, perfect thing, straight away, Obviously, I haven't dealt with this. Now, often what we want to do with parents is to say, oh, I've dealt with it, I've dealt with it, it must be the child, it must be something wrong with the child. No, no, it's actually still going on in you, and you've just suppressed it. Really important to see that. Any other comments about that? Uh, yeah, I can see that with my Yeah. Yeah. Um, like growing up and changing, and she's really not confident in it, and she's going to cover up and telling me all the time, put some clothes on, or go get dressed, and you know, and I know that's how I felt as a child, and she's showing it to me all the time. Yeah, it's how you still feel. Like. It is, but yeah. I still have a lot of it, but yeah, yeah. it's not wanting to deal with anything, I know here, but that's, I hated it, I hated it, you know, everything that's it. changing. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Issues of sexuality are very important to deal with as parents because they control how our children eventually grow up and how they interrelate with the opposite sex. And they control even the quality of the relationships they have with the opposite sex. So they're very, very important emotions to deal with. And when we have the sex and sexuality discussion, we confront a lot of those emotions that you may feel within you. The, um, the thing is with the children, is like, how many of you, if, if you walked up and saw two children playing with each other's private parts, and even just calling them private parts is interesting, but they're playing with each other's private parts and it's all in public, how would you respond? Be honest, how would you respond? How have you responded when you found this happening with your own children? Jen? When my kids were little, yes, I would have said, oh, you know, don't do that now. But now, uh, with the grandchildren, I can see that that was something that I suppressed in them that was coming from me yeah. because of my problems with my sexuality. Exactly. So I am changing that yeah. through my grandchildren and yeah. hopefully it'll get better. Yeah. yeah. So, so when your children were children, you were, uh, you were feeling like shutting them down straight away. Yeah. How many of you have done it? Oh, it's okay to do that. Or how many of you have even said it's okay to do it? But oftentimes we say it even, but what are we feeling? Like we're saying, oh, it's okay. And even inside we're going, don't do that, don't do that, in front of people, right? Inside there's a feeling that's totally different. You agree? That's often what's happening inside of us. Now, now when we have that feeling, that is the suppression. Here's our pal Jeremy, he's come up to join us. He's decided that he, what he wants to do is that you wanted to draw everyone a bit of the pictures, didn't you? Yeah, I think that's where it is. But we, just, we talked about this during the break. And we, so he's got his So some of you will be getting little cutouts, just like we got. Yeah. So the key, with all of, the key with all of our interactions with children sexually is we need to make sure, obviously, that our desires sexually are pure. If there is any projection whatsoever on our children, that's going to change things totally. A lot of the projections are of shame. So you know how you feel shame about your own body, for example, or shame about sex, or you know if your children come in and in, in on you when you're making love, how do you feel? Like there's this great big shame, huge, huge uh, reaction to cover up, and uh, 
Sometimes we may even yell at the child, get out, get out, what are you doing here? Whatever, you know. Now, all of those emotions are being projected at the child. What, are the, what is the child learning? They're learning to shut down sexuality, sex is bad. Speak up. Speak up. To <laughs> <laughs> be very private and secret about sex. Yeah. <laughs> so you've heard that. You? Yes, I yeah. have. <laughs> Which is why I'm not being vocal in this discussion. <laughs> yeah. So that doesn't mean that you would be, um, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> promiscuous or when you, when you show off your exhibitions. Um, so we're not, I'm not suggesting that, because that's driven by a desire for other types of attention, isn't it? That's driven by a desire to be loved, desire to be wanted, a desire to be thought of as fantastic, and all those other things which are also in, in disharmony with love. So the key is to focus on what am I feeling inside of myself emotionally with regard to sexuality? Because whatever you're not feeling inside of yourself is what your child is actually feeling. And shame, like shame about our sexual organs or about the way we look as a woman or a man. That's definitely something that gets passed on to children non-verbally. Like, yeah. yeah. Oftentimes a child will have some kind of problems with their sexual organs. Like lately I've uh, had a fair few uh, mothers talk to me about how their daughters' vaginas are all swollen and, and sore all the time. And, and sometimes their daughters have thrush or cystitis but they're not having sex or anything, they're only seven or eight years of age. And things like that, what's going on? And what's going on is that they're acting out, their body is acting out all of the mother's shame about her own sexual organs and things that have happened in her own life and usually to do with abusive issues uh, surrounding sex as well. That's what's actually going on. So look really seriously at those issues uh, with regard to sexuality and how those things are being projected at the child. Because when you don't own it, the child experiences it. So remember, every emotion you deny, the child will act out and experience, right down to physical response, every single emotion. That's pretty powerful, isn't it, to understand. That also is about the suppression of desire, too. So, we want to talk about desires. Yeah, so the other important thing we wanted to say about that was um, when people are, if you live in your passion, then you teach your child it's wonderful to be in your passion. If you feel that, oh, I can't be in my passion because I won't have enough money, or I really have an obligation to this family, or then automatically the child is learning it's actually too difficult to fulfill your dreams, it's too difficult to live in your in your passions in your life. So often we use the excuse of having a family to not follow our dreams or live in our passions, but it's actually quite damaging to the soul of that child because they learn that they can't do that in their own life. Mm -hmm. So how many of you feel like right at the moment the work, job you're working in is not the job you want? How many of you feel that? So about a third maybe of the audience, right? Okay, now if you've got children living with you with that feeling, you are actually teaching them to do jobs they don't like. Well, you have to deny yourself for money. So you're teaching them how to prostitute themselves for money, really. Does that make sense? So stop doing that. Live in your desire. Ask yourself what your desires are. If you don't know what your desires are, pray to God about your desires. Allow yourself to work through them and discover them and explore them. Work out what they are, and then when you know what they are, you'll be able to live in them. But if you go to live in your desires but you feel really guilty, like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm taking a pay cut and then my family won't have as much, and what, what's the emotion they're going to feel? Yeah, well, they'll, they'll feel like, oh, something's not quite right here. They'll, they'll, and they'll probably trigger the guilt in you. They'll say, oh, it's not fair, we didn't get new shoes. And, and that's because you actually feel guilty about your decisions to live in your passions. So it has to be a pure desire. Yeah. So like if you uh, do something that requires a pay cut, for example, to do what you enjoy, or you decide to work only three days a week and so you can spend two days a week doing what you enjoy more, and your children are affected by that, 
if you feel guilty about that, as Mary said, your children will reflect back to you your own guilt. So they'll, they'll make you feel more guilty uh, until you do that guilt about actually following your own desire. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to feel that guilt. Allow yourself to feel why you feel guilty about them not getting as much, but still follow your passion. Very important to follow your passion because otherwise your children don't know how to follow theirs. That's how they learn from you. So, so many, so many of us also do this with sports and things like that. You see, you know, you see this a lot in the uh, states and also here in Australia because we're sort of a fairly sporting mad sort of country. You see, the parents who haven't been successful in sports themselves often getting their children to be more and more successful and pushing and pushing and pushing success. You see that happening quite a lot. Do you ever feel yourself doing that as a parent? Wanting the child to succeed in a certain area of their life. Wanting to, to see them succeed in academics. Or wanting them to succeed in sports. Well, that is your unhealed emotion. Because in the end, what we need to be doing is encouraging them to feel what they want to do and encouraging them to do that. I received the projection that you should take every opportunity because you, you know, you have this opportunity. And so I ended up going into things that I didn't even really want to do because I should take up the opportunities. I had all these opportunities. So it's, it's sort of subtle sometimes as well. Yeah. So is there any questions about desires, following your desires that you'd like, that you'd like to ask? I'd like to revisit the, you know, when a child comes in and you're making love, um, that would confuse me, so... <laughs> <laughs> what would confuse you about it? Well, I don't know that I'd feel comfortable continuing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say you'd have to continue. <laughs> no, so, I know, I know, so, um, I would just like more input on what, what, you know, like, where does it go into sacred union that it is for the two of you, and, and maybe what? Yeah, I'm not entirely clear within myself on that. Firstly, and if both of you as a couple believed it was a sacred union and were totally okay with it being like, it being as it was a private event, right? And you didn't have any emotions of shame or guilt, you wouldn't attract your child coming in the room anyway. So the fact that your child came in the room means that you actually do have some emotions of guilt or shame about the sex act. So the first thing to do is go through those emotions. So, you know, obviously if it happens, you'll feel triggered. So, so you know, stop the whole process and start talking about, you know, how that made you feel. You know, I felt ashamed, I felt guilty, I felt whatever, whatever the feelings that you had. Work your way through those emotions, because that was the law of attraction. The event that was attracted by your own soul. So you may have felt that you were in a sacred union, but there are obviously other emotions regarding sexuality that needed triggering by embarrassment before you would feel them. So go into them and feel them. Remember, your child is a complete reflection of your own denied emotions. Your child wouldn't even come in the room if there wasn't an emotion inside of yourself. Does that make sense? So all you need to do is focus on what is the emotion inside of myself. If you think about all of your parenting in this way, it makes parenting quite simple when you think about it. Anything that happens that I'm distressed about with my child, there's an emotion I've just denied. That's a pretty simple thing, isn't it, to remember? Don't you think? And if I just keep remembering that and I keep remembering that with every single transaction, I'll work through all of the emotions it exposes. So can you see how that relates to that? Yeah, I can, but it's not just children. Since I've come across your work, it's everything. <laughs> it is everything. It's essentially everything. It is Once everything. you decide you want to deal with your emotions. Yeah. Which, is, which is great. Um, even you sending out that email, which I shared with some people, as Jesus and Mary, that was a 48-hour process for me. Yeah, exactly. Which is the reason why I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that one. No worries. Uh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, at what point do you feel you can stop 
if you don't know how much is yours and is, and do you just keep going and going until the law of attraction stops, even if it might be his? Uh, see, this is where many of us who are in separated partnerships want to believe it's the other person's the law of attraction. <laughs> how many of you feel like that? You want to believe it's the other guy? Is this the guy or it's the girl? It's not mine, right? <laughs> The truth is that, it's, that if it's happening with you and you have an emotional response, it's yours. So look at that every single time. Yeah. Yeah, don't put that off. Because you put, in the end, all it is is you're just saying, oh, I'm a bit ashamed of what's in me and I want my stuff to stop at some point. Well, your stuff will stop as soon as the law of attraction stops bringing it to you. And the law of attraction will stop bringing it to you as your soul condition changes. That's the, remember our session on the Law of Attraction? That's the beauty of the Law of Attraction, is it tells you the truth every single time. Which probably brings us to our next session, which is about the Child's Law of Attraction. Mm. So what creates the Child's Law of Attraction? The Child's Law of Attraction. Um, everything about the Child's Law of Attraction is really your Law of Attraction. But of course, as the child grows, it starts gathering its soul condition. And as its soul condition changes, it, it changes. And as, as it, its soul condition changes, new law of attraction events are brought upon by its own soul condition. So in the end, if the child is in its teenage years, its law of attraction will be a combination of yours and the child's. Does that make sense? And if, but, but from then on, right the way through its life, it's going to be a combination of yours and the child's law of attraction. So if your children are 60, 50, 40, and you're 70, what's happening between you and your children are still, is still a lot about your own law of attraction and the damage you've done with your own children. Because their free will choices will be influenced by their soul condition, which is a fairly direct result of your own soul condition. So there'll always be a link. So if that's the case, when something happens to my child, what do I need to do in every single circumstance? Exactly. What emotion inside of myself am I denying? How do I feel about that event? So ask yourself firstly, how am I feeling about this? So going back to the one where the child walking in on you making love, how do I feel? Shame. Like, or you may feel like you took out time from the child that you shouldn't have, or something like that. You might have all sorts of different emotions that might have caused that to occur. Allow yourself to feel them there and then, just like a child would. I don't know if Peter minds, but I was talking to Peter the other day, and he's having a situation with one of his adult sons, but actually the emotions that his son is feeling are triggering a lot of emotions for him about his mum. So that's a fair comment, Peter? So even an adult child and the feelings you have in the interaction with an adult child will be about your own law of attraction and the, and the interaction between that and the child's condition. And even this is an event happening in Peter's child's life, so it's not even really related to his interaction with his son, but the event that's happening in, your life, in his life is actually the cause of... You can find the causal emotion within you that probably caused the law of attraction for your son to have yeah, this series event. of events. Mm. So like if a, if a, if a son, let's, let's say you have a daughter, and the daughter is married and they have a split up, they, you know, they only married two years and they split up. Well that will be partly your own law of attraction. And the reason why is because your daughter's emotions were created mostly by her environment, of which you were mostly a part. So therefore it's to do with something about your own law of attraction. But that's why we often have a lot of very strong feelings about what happens to our children. The reason why is because it's that we know at the soul level we created a lot of their emotions. And we know that. But we and we feel responsible for that. The truth is we don't have to now you know, change their life for them. What we need to do is change our own life. Change our own emotions. Because if we try and change their life or fix it for them, um, 
there's still the there's still the contrast between what we're saying and how our soul feels. It'll only be powerful to help your child, or it will be the most powerful. Is that a good way to say it? To help your child once you have dealt with the emotion yourself, especially if it's an adult child. Yeah. So can you see the importance of looking at their law of attraction? So let's say your child breaks a leg. If you see it as your law of attraction, right, then you'll be far better off in solving those kind of problems than you will be in thinking that it's some kind of, uh, in, like, what do you call it? Coincidental event. What do you call it? Gentleness. My son did break his ankle once. So if I had gone and said to him, how are you feeling at the moment? You know, what are your feelings at the moment? Would that help me to get in touch with the feelings that I had if I wasn't aware of them? Probably not. Because the issue is not what he was feeling, but what you were feeling at the moment. So you how did... So how would I get the connection if, say for instance, so say you... for instance he was at school yeah. and I was at work yeah. and he broke his leg yeah. and, you know, an hour later I'm with him and that sort of thing and I've forgotten all about what was happening for me an hour ago. Yep. Yeah. So how do I get in touch Going with that? Going to the event that you can connect to, which is the fact that you're now patching up a child who's broken his leg. You're now sitting in the hospital waiting for the doctor to come and set his leg and you're going through all of these different emotions, the first thing you do is tune into all of those emotions, all of the feelings of responsibility that you have and all of those other feelings that are all coming up, go into those emotions rather than trying to run away from them. If you're feeling panic, go into the panic and the fear that you feel. So how many, how many, if you, if you had got a phone call from your school saying, please come quickly, your child's hurt themselves, how many of you would go into this terrible panic? All right? Feel that, because that's one of the events that it's triggering for you. Does that make sense? Feel the responsibility, feel that. So go through all of those first. Then, when you've gone through all of those, a lot of times what will come to you is what you were feeling probably at the time the event occurred. Does that make sense? But if that doesn't, then ask the child, when did it occur? But you don't need to ask the child their feelings so much, because it's to do with your feelings. So you remember the incident, incident I re related before the break? where the lady had this, was relating this experience with her dad just before her dad died. Two days before her dad died, she visited her father. And, and how the daughter was crying. Remember I was relating that experience. She didn't have to focus on what was the daughter feeling. Because the daughter was feeling quite obviously sad. The daughter didn't even know why she was feeling sad. Right? What she needed to do is look at what within herself, what she just said, what she just stated that she wasn't connected with an emotion about. So quite often I've been talking with parents, for example, we've been sitting down together, like around in a small group, you know, maybe 15 people or so, and we're talking, and I'll start focusing on one of the parents' emotions that they've asked me some questions about. And all of a sudden, their child, who's outside playing, rips out through the door, runs into the, jumps on their laps and starts pulling their ears and pulling their hair and like, what's going on? She said, oh, he's so distracting. He's so distracting, right? And I'm saying, I'm sorry, but you do not want to hear this conversation. That's why he's distracting you. He, he felt her emotion, her emotion. I want to get away from this. I want to get away from this somehow. You know, please, someone come and rescue me from this conversation. And so him, who's outside, comes running in and jumps on her lap and rescues her from the conversation. And then she blames him and says, he's so distracted. But in reality, she wanted to be distracted. So quite often I say, right, at, at that moment, you wanted to be distracted. You feel your emotion. Your emotion was you didn't want to hear what I was saying to you. You opened your mouth and said, AJ, please tell me this. And then right at the same time, the feeling was, I hope he doesn't tell me anything because I'm scared stupid of what he's going to say, right? <laughs> and so that emotion got projected and the child is the perfect response every single time to the emotion we deny in the parent, as a parent. Do you see what happens pretty constantly? Right over there. Um, AJ, lately 
when my child, 11 year old, has been having, getting upset about something, he just seems to run off, or he goes off to his room crying, or whatever has happened. And something, I just don't, I'm not really feeling any resistance, or I don't want to change him. I'm really happy that he's gone off to cry about it. And I am denial, because very quickly, it just passes. He doesn't go on and on like he used to. Um, and I'm just feeling very connected to him and what he's feeling. Yeah. But am I just in denial with actually what is happening? What's actually happening in your son's case? He's 11, isn't he? You said? Yep. What's happening in his case is because you've released some emotions, uh, particularly about men, uh, over the past few months, uh, over the past year actually, you've released quite a lot about it, he's now actually just allowed to experience his emotions that, he's held, that, that have been within him by himself. The fact that he's not coming to you and doing it with you means that it's not to do with something that's still within him. It's actually something that's now just within him that he will need to release. And it'll be quite rapid for him to do that because he's so young. He'll be able to release it within 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, and it's done. And he'll feel quite differently afterwards. So the key is just to allow that to occur. And if he was personally reacting with you and crying at you and wanting hugs from you and all those kind of things in that process, then yes, it would be something to do with your own feelings that you're denying or shutting down. But the truth is, in your situation, you've been quite open and dealing with some man issues and things like that over the last year, and that's actually enabling him now to actually just release the emotions he felt of injustice and things like that about being projected upon as a male. And so he's doing that quite naturally, and he's doing it quite privately because he doesn't need to do that with you. You've actually made it quite easy for him to deal with those emotions, which is great. Yeah. I forgot to pick him up from school on Thursday. Right. He has to carry this enormous instrument. Yep. And he cried, and then I repeated, you know, 20 pounds free on the road. And I'm driving up the road, and there he was carrying this big, enormous thing, and he said, I waited 15 minutes for you, you know, carrying this thing. And I just thought, gosh, I should be feeling really guilty. And I just felt really happy. So yeah. I just wanted to check, was I denying what I've done to him or... If you felt guilt, you would have been denying a deeper emotion. If you felt shame as a parent, if you felt angry, you would have been denying. If you felt any of those kind of emotions, you would have been denying. If you cried, it would have been the release of a cause of emotion. The fact that you stayed happy means that probably you actually created that event to help him trigger one of his emotions unknowingly to yourself. And we often do this at the soul level. So what I find myself doing in interactions now a lot is I'll just say something to somebody. I don't mean anything by it, but it just happens to be exactly the thing that triggers them um, into an emotion. And I felt quite happy and I was fine, <laughs> but, but they felt the emotion. So you'll find the more you clear away your own emotions, what actually happens is you start responding like a child to other person's emotions. Does that make sense? So you'll get to a point in your own progression where you will be like a child in the way you respond to everyone's emotion. And that will trigger everyone around you just like your own child does with you right now. And that is a, a, and that's the place where I was in the first century in that place. Just automatically just doing all these things without really thinking about them, but everyone around me was being triggered by all sorts of different things that I was doing. Does that make sense? And that's what's starting to happen with yourself. That's actually a very good sign that you've released quite a lot of emotion. So that's positive for you, isn't it? Yeah. Then the sense. And then you get the car. Does that mean there was heaps of disciples everywhere? <laughs> in what way? Then? When, in the first century, when you were going around through all these emotions. Yeah, that, basically everyone around me who met me finished up getting triggered in some way. Obviously, anger was the dominant emotion in most of them, but uh, there were all sorts of emotions being triggered all the time. And uh, none of that, obviously, is recorded in the Bible very much. Although there are instances that are recorded in the Bible about the anger. This is really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, my question was um, about, the, about the child's emotion and also with this sexuality thing. 
the child that walks in from his parents making love, how does that stay with him? Well, I can, I can, I'm only relating it from my own experience. And, um, That's well, going to be depend totally on how the parents treat oh, the issue. Because yeah. I, I, I think about it occasionally, I, it's not nothing to my mind, but I just... Depends what emotions were projected upon you when you did it. So right. this is where it's very important the parents I, own their own emotions. I think it was a little bit, get out! Yeah, so straight away, the reason probably why you've been thinking of it a bit lately is because it will be, it'll be triggering issues of shame about sexuality right. or observing sexuality. Okay. So the key is to work your way through that emotionally, the feeling that you had when you were yelled at to get out and you didn't even mean to be there. There was also another feeling that you had of injustice, like, you know, you didn't mean to do no, anything no. wrong and you're getting treated badly. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, so absolutely. allow yourself to feel about that. Yeah, because the only, I, again, I don't know whether these are triggers throughout my life, but I can, I've never been uh, one to worry if the children were about when they were making love with my wife or whatever. Yeah. But she always was. Yes. So whether she was tr trying to trigger me or was it just her own stuff? Well, if she was, then it was probably related to, there would have been a law of attraction for you, and that is the law of attraction related to the fact that you walk in on your parents. Right. And, you know, I mean, there's a link to every single event. Okay. So allow yourself, to, again, to feel your own emotions about the childhood event. That's the important thing. Okay. Now, if the parents in that situation didn't project any emotion at the child that was negative at all, then what would happen is the child would forget about it five minutes time, probably. They wouldn't feel any embarrassment, they wouldn't feel any shame, they wouldn't feel any injustice, they wouldn't feel, you know, even, even really like laughing at their parents or anything like that necessarily, because if the parents had dealt with all those emotions, it would just be another event in life, do you know? And they wouldn't have any emotional response of that for that. Yeah. In the front, uh, can you remember your question? It's alright, have a breathe. The lady up the back, um, I just brought up a lot for me because it's okay. You can come back to that later. Feel the emotion now. That's good. That's good. Fair enough. Right up behind you. I'd like to know when I don't have to have in my life my dad's law of attraction for his life. When you had released all of the emotions created, created by that link, you would no longer have hit a parent's law of attraction. So what that's telling you is if you're getting very, very similar things happening in your life as your dad has happened in his life, right, then that's telling you that the emotions inside of you related to your dad are not healed yet in those particular areas. And the key is to allow yourself to feel about them and process them. When you heal them, the, the linkage between your father and yourself will be broken, but also what will be broken is the same law of attraction. You'll have a completely different law of attraction. Yeah. Lisa, thanks. Oh, I just thought that, you know, I've just come to realisation. Yeah, awesome. You know, when, <laughs> Yep. It'll be like two hours before he gets home, hasn't shed a tear, looks at me, and totally falls apart. Right. Yeah, so I've just realised that would have been all my stuff. And he feels in the Christ that he's showing me. And yep. Is that right? Totally right. And also, he can only feel his emotions when he's in your company. Lots of good Harley there. Uh, certainly. It's, it's going to be an issue that you also have about crying. Because he's interacting with you, you see. Mm. Remember, every interaction with you has to do with you. And we're going to have to wait for them to come back. How many of them is there? Lots. Lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> come around for a cruise. Children is a lot of parents have a fear of actually having to talk to their children about sex and maybe explain what they're doing. Very true. 
And it's a major problem, isn't it? Most children grow up, how many of you grew up and when you had your first sexual experience, it was the first time you actually learned about sex? You know, that, that's probably happened for the majority of people, in fact, of our, our age bracket. Um, so, yeah, there, there's obviously a lot of emotions involved in that as well. But just remember that every single time your child interacts with you, if the interaction is with you, then it's to do with your law of attraction. So if he goes up to mummy, then it's mummy's law of attraction. If he goes up to dad, it's dad's law of attraction. Does that make sense? That's what's happening at the time. Any other questions at all? I've just had a, a memory about my oldest son when he was 16. He had two pretty major events happen within two weeks of each other to the, to the day. The first one was um, he got hit by a car. He'd been smoking dope and was crossing a major highway and his friend called out to him and said, don't go and he got thrown over the top of the car and his friend ran all the way home to tell me. He said, um, his, my son's first reaction was, oh, mum's going to kill me. He was already nearly dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm sure this is going to bring up something. Um, and then two weeks later, he'd been at a school dance and he was coming home and... Um, he and his friend got uh, two guys stopped because they were dressed in fancy dress after school events. And these guys thought they were gay yep. and uh, they were going to beat the crap out of them with a baseball bat. Yep. And um, my son said, all of a sudden, Mum, I just intuitively knew that it was time to run and I screamed and they got away from me. Yep. And I know that's got to be about me. Yeah. Um, in particular, that it happened two weeks apart. Yeah. And I guess I'm just a little confused. I mean, I was born, brought up in a violent household, so. Yeah. And the first, the first incident and the second incident are due to different emotions within you. The second incident is due to your violent childhood and the fears and other emotions that you have about that still that you need to allow yourself to release. Your, what will happen in your children's life often is that, see, often we don't feel fear for ourselves. Once we, when we, if we've grown up in a violent household, what often happens is that we detune so much from the fear, we go into anger, rage and other types of emotions and we detune from the fear. But the fear is still within us. And often then it's the only way to trigger it is through our children. And, and so what, what happens is that um, our law of attraction, which is the fear that's in the child, actually attracts events which then trigger our own fear. And that's what you need to allow yourself to process. This, the feelings that you have about the violent, abusive childhood you have. Um, and some of it was to do with sexuality right, as well. So you need to let you know what I'm speaking about there in the the, the second, the second, the first issue, which is your, your son, you know, having a accident. Um, the key thing there is to look at your own emotions. Firstly, after you heard about the accident, so go into those emotions. But then ask yourself if you can the emotions that you felt that day, like before the accident occurred as well. Now that's a lot harder generally, unless we we know to ask those kind of questions of ourselves. But what I do now is I ask myself, you know, what was I doing before that occurred? Before that accident that was occurred? Ten, just about ten years ago. So yeah, so it's hard now. Yeah. I'm sure I'll be able to go and do that. Yeah. And the reason why his first words were, Mum's going to kill me, I've been pleased. Yeah. And I'm Yeah, see, everything that is said is said for some reason from the law of attraction as well. So you can, a lot of times I notice that people don't hear what they're saying to me when they come and ask me about a problem. And the reason why is that they're, all, they're just far, so far detuned from the emotion that the actual words that they're saying to me tell all, me all the emotions 
that they're actually denying within themselves. And I can feel the emotions at the same time, so then I can have that correlation. But most of the time, the person's already telling themselves the answer to their own issue. Yeah. And, and I do realise, see, with Brian, I'm feeling a lot of my unresolved fears. Yeah, you have a lot of unresolved fears about danger and safety, and uh, they're very much involved in that first incident that, uh, of his accident. Yeah. Very protective. Yeah. 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 I was just going to ask if everyone was clear about children's law of attraction because Asia gets asked that all the time. Like, what's what's their law of attraction? What's the parents' law of attraction? Is that clear to everyone now? Basically, pretty much everything's your law of attraction <laughs> <laughs> as a parent. Now, the only proviso to that is that, obviously, as the child grows older, what's your law of attraction is how they relate to you. So, for instance, if your child's 20, relating to you in a certain way, that's your law of attraction. But if they're relating with other people in different ways, that's a combination of what you've created in them and their own decisions, which is not just your law of attraction, but it's a combination of yours and theirs. If that makes sense. Um, one thing I'm slightly concerned about is that um, I, find, I feel that there's a lot of things that happen that I, I might, for example, with my guy um, and And it fixes it for that time, but then it keeps coming over my own. So obviously I'm not getting to pause it. Um, and that's the problem I have. I don't feel like getting to pause it. Yeah. And so my concern is that if I don't deal with the cause in time, that my children will suffer. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at that issue. How do I know that I've accessed the causal? You're right. If it happens over and over again, then I haven't accessed the causal. However, that doesn't mean that I haven't accessed certain aspects of the causal in each event. See, a lot of times what we often do is we think, oh, if it's happened again, then I mustn't have dealt with it at all. But what I've noticed in my own processing is that I will deal with one issue about the causal, but be too afraid to deal with another issue about the causal. So let's say the causal event may be something that happened in a child of like, Let me give you an example for myself a couple of days ago, what I was dealing with was um, I, I realised, I had this realisation at the soul level that I didn't want to be loved. I was thinking before then that I did want to be loved and nobody could love me. But then I had this realisation, the fact that nobody loved me meant that I didn't want to be loved. And then I had to allow myself to just ponder about that, pray about that for a bit. And then after I did that, I realised there was a series of five or six events that came to me from what would be the equivalent of my childhood for you, but it's my first century experience, of events where, where somebody loved me and they died as a result of loving me. And then I had lots of memories about the millions of people who've been tortured to death because they loved me. And, and all of these different feelings of responsibility about that. And then I had some feelings about you know, what happened to Mary and her life because she loved me and, and went through lots of different emotions there about that as well. And what I realised was that there was this one aspect of wanting to be loved that I, I was dealing with before then. Then I realised that I didn't want to be loved. And then there were so many facets to that. Like, there were just so many, like, and still are. I've got some more coming up now still about it. And so far I've dealt with nearly 15 or 16 of the different facets of not why I don't want to be loved. But I can still feel there's some more there in me, just, just some events and memories that occur. So, so my law of attraction is not going to change. I'm not going to get loved completely, right, until I deal with those completely. But... Um, so the law of attraction will keep bringing me situations where people treat me, treat me unlovingly until I deal with them completely. But that doesn't mean that I haven't dealt with some of them. All right? So just be careful about the judgement that oh, I mustn't have dealt with any of it because it, there's a chance you have. But second thing I'd like to say is that if you have the same repeat, repeating events occurring, then yes, there is a possibility that the cause of emotion is not being addressed. The question you need to ask yourself is, when I feel, am I feeling about the current event? Or am I feeling about a childhood event? 
If I'm feeling about a childhood event, there's a high likelihood my causal emotion is involved in that event. If I'm feeling about the current event, then it's only an effect emotion. Does that make sense? Just... I find if I can't remember a childhood event, then I just ask myself, is the emotions I'm feeling childlike, or are they adult-like? Exactly. So if you have an adult-like feeling in your experience of this emotion, then it's highly likely you're not getting at the cause. If you're having a childlike experience in the experience of the emotion, you may be getting at the cause. Not, com not necessarily, but you may be. When I say maybe, a lot of times there are blockages to the cause at the child level, and you do need to deal with the blockages to the cause. So block my blockages to the underlying emotion that I had there, I wasn't feeling loved. And I didn't recognise that it was because I didn't want to be loved. Does that make sense? That was the big thing that I couldn't recognise. So I kept getting events where I where it wasn't being loved, crying about not being loved, right? But not recognising the truth yet that actually I didn't want to be loved because everyone who ever loved me finished up dying or being tortured to death because of it. You follow me? So um, what I'm saying, I suppose, is that oftentimes our, you know, we might be crying about a childhood event that we think is causal, but actually the cause is actually just underneath that. And the key is to pray about that. If you know that it's happening regularly, just pray about it more and allow your law of attraction to show you that it might be something deeper again. And I've had a lot of those kind of flip side emotions where I wanted to be loved and I was wondering why I wasn't loved and nobody was loving me. Thinking, and I was thinking that it was because I was feeling unlovable. But actually it's not because of that. It's because I felt like I don't want to be loved because if I'm loved, the person who loves me, this deep feeling of responsibility for their life was the actual cause. Does that make sense? You may find that flip side type of emotion inside of you quite often. I think that's exactly what I've got. When, when my kids tell me they love me, I feel very uncomfortable. The other day, when you we were just saying before about the words that you say are important, the other day when Anna said to me, I love you, Mum, before I could even think an answer, I said, no, you don't. And then, of course, the older child of me says, that was a very awful thing to say, and feels really guilty about it. But I think, like you're saying, it's feeling fearful or feeling responsible for people that love you. Yes. So what do you do with that? So you need to go into that emotionally. So you know the feeling, no, you don't love me. Yes. Feel that. So feel that what it feels like to not be loved. And then ask yourself, well, why don't I want to be loved? Just ask yourself that question. Well, like I said, it's that weight of responsibility of their happiness. If they love you, you feel responsible for So them. what do you feel will happen if, if they love you? Ask yourself that. What's going to happen when they love you? Why is it a weight? I don't know, but I think I killed my husband because he... <laughs> yeah. Um, just that I... It's, it's a big responsibility to feel that somebody's happiness depends on you. No, see, so that, that's the intellect now working. What's the emotion? What's going to happen if they love you? What's going to happen? You, 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 you're not good enough. Yeah. Now you're starting to get there emotionally. You're not, you're not worthy of your love. You're not worthy of their love. So now you're starting to get a bit deeper. Does that make sense? Yeah. So keep going deeper than that. Yeah. If you want to, now here and now, you're connecting to it, Karen. You may as well do it. Yeah, because you, you, you go into this place emotionally of, of tuning away from your sadness. So you've taught yourself a lot to get away from causal sadness. So you, you, you were just about there. You, you were just like, if you can think of the gap between where you are and the emotion, you were like that close just then to getting it. <laughs> no, you need to really do it yourself. 
but you were just that far away from actually feeling a causal emotion. Right? So if you follow that chain of thought down now in privacy, when you go home or whatever, you just follow that chain of thought back down like you did just now with us, you'll get to the causal emotion. And your daughter was a good trigger. She's just reflecting back at she, She's saying, I love you, Mum. It's just a reflection back at you of triggering some of these emotions. So. And Karen just said, I think I killed my husband with this song. That's a pretty big song. Just to, like there's something under that for you. Um, he was good and I just thought that so many five people now I have to be responsible for the happiness for rather than six people. That was and you need to go along with that thought. Allow yourself to follow that thought down into your emotions. It will help you a lot accessing childhood things about love. You're pretty close to it, Karen. Very close to it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Fire away. Um, my question is like, when you, when you, whenever you say allow, mm -hmm. I have a little difficulty with that because I feel like, where's my control over the release of the emotion? You know, I just, I feel like I don't have the control. Yep. And I, I've sat for up to four hours before just seeing that and going and deal with something like that. Yeah. And nothing happens. And I just, I found the last couple of months of my life have been quite depressed. Yeah. And just getting stuck in a feeling that's not moving or there's no emotion to be like, but I went up. Yep. And what do you do about that? Okay, what do you do about that, is it? What's happening inside of yourself is that there is a blockage blocking the free flow of emotion. So if we look at how a child processes emotion, and this is one of the subjects we want to talk about, how we can learn from children. One way the child processes emotion is that there is a suit, it, it just involves itself in its life, right? Just runs around, usually totally out of control, we think of as, as adults, which is how we need to be really. We run around doing all these different things, and what happens is some event, the law of attraction event, triggers an emotion, triggers something happening to the child. So what the child then does is what? What does it do? It just goes straight into the emotion, doesn't it? It doesn't think about it, it doesn't have to decide what the emotion's about, and a lot of times it doesn't even know what the emotion is. All it just is like, so if it gets treated, somebody comes along, bops it in the nose, generally it'll either go into a rage-based emotion or just fall down on the floor and have a big cry, right? One of those two emotions. It, it just experiences it there and then. Now that being the case, if that doesn't happen inside of myself, it can only be because of a block. So sometimes when we feel stuck, what we need to do is start asking ourselves questions about blocks. What is the block? What is the fear that I have about emotion? One of the fears in your question was already mentioned. You have a fear of control or being out of control, in fact. That's one of the fears. You're afraid that if you do feel your causal emotion to its core, that you'll be out of control. And that's a very, very big block to allowing the emotion to flow. So rather than addressing the, the emotion, do you follow me? Allow yourself to actually pray about and ponder about the blockage, which is the desire to control, the desire to control the process. Ask yourself questions like, why do I want to control the process? What's going to happen to me? What am I afraid of if I don't control this process? Does that make sense? Ask yourself those questions. I often thought it could be, like, I don't know if anyone else has this, but just from past spiritual practices and having a way of, I don't know if everyone, if anyone's got into becoming consciousness and not really, you know, just sort of merging with life and being in this blissful state. I've, I've got this fear that because I've found that way of being, yep. that I will never be able to be real again. And, you know, and it's just me and I fear talking right now. Yes. And this is where you need to go. You need to talk about this, write about it. I'm afraid of it now. And yep. I'm, I don't keep jumping back in the head, but yep. like, you know, how do I get to the next step? So, so acknowledge your fears now. So you actually allow yourself to feel your fear that it's never going to be how you thought it would be. You know, allow yourself to feel your fear about how you, you've got yourself into this 
sort of quasi, um, what would you call it, at one with the universe state, but it doesn't feel good inside. And allow yourself to feel your fear about, you know, what it's going to really feel like when you do it for real. You know, allow yourself to feel your fears about all those things. See, a, a child rarely has blockages. So, if we, and this is a, this is why looking at children to deal with emotions is really good. Like, you know, example, little Jeremy coming in here, right? He's happy being down the front here, cutting up his paper and everything. Every one of you seeing him walk past, walk past, walk past. He doesn't care, does he? He does. He's not worried about. Oh, what are they going to think of me now? You know, oh, they must think I'm stupid. Uh, you know, and none of those thoughts go through his mind, do they? Like, he's just going, he's just going and through here, out, through, out. We can learn a lot from that. See, what we do is we add a heap of suppression on top of that. So what we're now thinking is, oh, I can't do what Jeremy's doing because, you know, I'll get in trouble or I'll get this or I'll get that. You know, I'll get projection from people or people won't like me anymore. Or, we get all of those, and they are what I call the blockages. And the hardest part of this part that I'm explaining to you is the blockages. It's a terrible, terrible, torturous road of working through blockages. Once you release the blockages, you'll find the emotion will just pop up. You'll just be walking along in a day, you know, you're having a normal interaction, and all of a sudden, bam, you're in the emotion, and you say, wow, where did that come from? That'll happen quite often the more blockages you release. So one of the blockages you've got is this blockage of control, wanting to keep everything in control. Another blockage is this, is this blockage of spirituality, what appears spiritual and what isn't, and things like that, you know. There's, so you've already mentioned quite a number of your blockages in our little discussion. Allow yourself to note them down and pray about them now. Allow yourself to feel them and where they came from. And when you release these blockages, and some of them will be released emotionally, once you release the blockages, what's underneath the block will automatically just flow out of you. And you won't have to access it. It'll just come like a child. The blocks are the hardest thing. You want to say something? Uh, no, I just thought maybe that's a good time to go in, because we wanted to talk about what we can learn from children. Well, I thought it'd be good to talk about how you, how you feel blocked sometimes. And, yeah. yeah, I feel blocked a lot. <laughs> um, and I do agree that it's the hardest thing, uh, recognising and feeling the blocks. Last week I had a, um, a couple of hours where I was almost hyperventilating, just uh, being in fear and trying to stay in fear because it's really been blocking me for a long time. Um, what were you thinking of something in particular? Well, I was thinking that it, um, over the last year, like there's been lots of different, like the, the process for Mary has been, it's taken, it just so, Mary's been a person who's always been relatively connected with her emotion, right? All through her life. She's had, uh, has, she, she's had a sort of an, av an average sort of an upbringing where there is blockages and, and also love given to her, but there's, there is all the Mary herself was a very is a very emotional person. When it came to a year ago, when she met me, I stopped feeling emotion because <laughs> so. I was very afraid. Um, yeah. yeah, so I worked through heaps of blocks about loss of control, identity, ridicule. What's my life going to mean? Like. Um, yeah, am I giving my power away? Um, and lots of things that I just had to talk about for a long time. Some things I released emotionally, some I just sort of had realisations of truth. Um, some kind of got released when I connected with God a bit more. Yeah, yeah so, so that whole period of time of, uh, of just over a year, or just about a year, Mary was dealing with blockages but feeling very, very frustrated connecting with emotion. So, where did they look Yeah, I felt like I couldn't cry anymore. I was like, what is wrong with me? I used to cry at TV ads and now I can't cry. <laughs> and I really thought, and it really did, t it took almost a year for me to properly connect with causal emotion. Um, and I can recognise that that's because 
my cause of emotion means a lot about my identity, and so that was a huge block. Um, but now that I sort of um, broke through a barrier or something, I still get blocked, but it's not the same. It's not this frozen up feeling of like, oh, I can't like I used to say to AJ, find the button on me that is the tears, because I can't do tears anymore, you know, there must be a place. Um, but now it just sort of um, comes a lot freer and rawer. And even processing the fear, like instead of just living in the fear, I actually felt it, like it was a physical process. So you see how she had this bad, and, and I've seen this happen, this happened in myself and, and every other person I've actually met, where it's very, I've met very few people who've been able to get straight away into their emotions. Most of the time they've had a year of blockages to undo and then they start getting into some cause of emotion. Because once the blockages are there, you're becoming more and more like a child once the blockages are gone and then the emotion just pops up. And so I felt the change in Mary when she, she, she went from, from finding every emotion very difficult to actually desiring every emotion. And there was a switch that happened probably only maybe six to eight weeks ago, uh, that where she made a switch from from still trying to fight every emotion, control every emotion, into actually now desiring every emotion. So perhaps using the word allow isn't the right word. Perhaps the right word is really desire, uh, to actually get to a point where you desire all of your emotion. And when you get to that point, and that's about releasing all of these blockages that were piled on you from the moment you were born or even the moment you were conceived onwards. It's about releasing those. When you release those, all of the emotions flow really quite rapidly after that. And I, it was also about releasing judgment about emotion. Like before I would be so afraid of the emotion, I think, oh, if I have this emotion, I'm a bad person. This is me, I am this emotion. And now it sort of feels more like like a voyage of discovery, like, oh, I've got that in me, oh, okay, oh, let's get that out, sort of, it's different, yeah. So instead of seeing everything like a pain, you see everything like a pleasure, you know, it's like every new thing you discover about yourself feels good to discover, even, even if you before used to judge it as bad. So like, it's like self saying, so, oh boy, I'm a sexual deviant actually. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that about myself before. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let, let's deal with that, you know. Uh, rather than going, oh, you know, and, and every sexual deviant that comes into your path, getting angry with them and all that kind of stuff, which is all the avoidance happening. So, you know, look at every discovery of yourself as a, as a wonderful thing. And, uh, and things will start flying as well. But allow, you, you're, you're dealing, um, like you are dealing with your blocks. You, you're just feeling like, you know, the causal isn't happening and so you're feeling quite despondent. The key is to not, you don't need to be that despondent. Of course, if there's an emotion under it, go for that. But, but you need to see that you are actually pro progressing. The feelings that I get from you now are far less, there's far less resistance in you uh, than there was before. You, you've got rid of a blockage about, about God. You know, is there really a God? You know, am I willing to experiment with that? You've got really uh, rid of a blockage about should I try to do something that uh, that might not work in the end? You know, fear of that. So there's quite a few blockages that you're all childhood blockages that you've already got rid of that you can feel are gone. So you, you are progressing. It's just that it's just that that cause of emotion will flow when some, when more of those blockages get released. Is that, I know a lot of you have probably had that question, so that's why I spend a bit of time on that. Is that understandable to everyone, what's going on there? Up back and then... Uh, over there first, yeah. Um, yeah, at this time I can totally Yep. So, That's a good sign, actually. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just wondering, are you talking about complete surrender to God? Is that, is that a good place to start? 
a very good place to start. In fact, that that was where Mary's turning point, wasn't it, for you? And it was certainly my turning point as well. When you completely surrender to God and surrender to your emotions as well in that process, you'll find your law of attraction will just ramp up because there's a soul desire now for you to experience emotion. And if you just allow yourself to experience everything that comes along, you'll be able to get rid of things very, very rapidly. But yeah, it's very much about your connection with God. Yeah, it just, even though I can still get into emotion, I feel blocked and I can observe how long it takes to get worse. Yeah. So, and that's making you feel pretty afraid. Yeah. And how bad is it going to have to be before I unblock? And yeah. very frustrated. And yeah. Yep. And this is why most people stop at this point. See, most people would stop at this point. They feel themselves getting depressed, feel themselves becoming afraid, and they're saying, look, what AJ is teaching me is just ruining my life, right? And a lot of people feel that. Right? And I think I've mentioned that a lot of people feel that before. But what's actually happening is you're getting closer and closer to the point of surrender. And, and getting to that point means getting rid of all of your fear, about surrender. It means getting rid of all your anger and frustration about surrender. Getting rid of all your anger and frustration about your law of attraction and a lot of things like that. And they are all emotions still. So understand you are actually working through emotions but they're just blockage emotions that you're working through. And that's okay. When you get into depression, there's, that's coming from the desire within you to try and stop the process. So the key is to to not try to stop the process so much. Just allow the process to continue. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. The, these are all emotions. Frustration is an emotion. It's a capping emotion. Yeah. And you need to feel it. Yeah. Anger is a capping emotion. You need to feel it. And you, when you let yourself feel it fully, if you get into a rage with God, you're allowed to be in a rage with God. Get into a rage with God. Express it towards God. And you'll find that you'll release some stuff there there will be a connection that happens afterwards. So allow yourself to go through those experiences. Yeah. Re realise that you're not... You, you are progressing. You're not stagnant. Yeah. Many of you are feeling you're stagnant and what I'm seeing is that you're not. And the reason why you're feeling stagnant is because you are actually dealing with capping emotions which must be dealt with. You have to deal with these capping emotions. They have to be dealt with. But causal emotion doesn't get released in dealing with them. And so the law of attraction doesn't change. And so you feel like you're stagnant. But the capping emotions are very essential emotions to work your way through too. So it's very important. And then somebody over here had a question. Yep. Um, just, I actually have a ability to make scenarios up in my childhood that didn't happen. Yep. My say this family when this happened, my sister was saying, no, that didn't actually happen. And yep. I've got blanks in my childhood. Yep. I mean, obviously it's a big blockage, but how do you actually work through that when your childhood some of it seems to <laughs> And a child only, or an adult, only creates fantasy because they don't want to face reality. So I need to work through those emotions and ask, you need to ask yourself, why are you creating fantasies? What are you afraid of? So it'll be back to some major fears that you have about the reality of your childhood. And we, what happens with a lot of children, and it's a very clever thing we do as a child, to get away from emotion, what we do is we create an altered reality in our own mind, and we then live in that reality. This often happens in abusive uh, families, and abusive in, in abusive childhoods. But it also can happen in other childhoods where we feel like we're not uh, having as good a life as the other children around us are having. And so then we create these realities so that we can feel like we've just lived as full of life as the next child. Does that make sense? So there's, other, there's quite a lot of different emotions that drive us creating fantasies from our childhood. So allow yourself to feel about what some of those emotions may be. There's a second one. The second one, I think, applies with you a bit, doesn't it? Where you feel that you're, you know, that 
that as a child you didn't have as interesting a life as many other children have had and then wanted to create some fantasies so that it becomes more interesting then. Yeah. It's okay to just see, it's okay to see the truth in yourself. Right? <laughs> yeah. And over here things. everything I want to ask as well, but I just want to add to it. I just feel really blocked in guilt about being a parent. And I feel like I've been guilty for my son's whole 13 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm still fit at the moment. Yes. And, um, I feel like I just... I put everything off to him that's my stuff, which probably have. And it's really throwing back the law of attraction at people really heavily at the moment. Because he's quite angry with you at the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's showing me that. Mm -hmm. And I know inside me that it's my own. And I just feel like I'm just like spread it out of guilt. Yeah. And for most of us, guilt is not a cause of emotion. And what I mean by that is that uh, guilt is usually a created emotion usually from our own life or from the lives of our parents dumping guilt on us. Now, the, the key thing with guilt is to... Guilt, guilt is driven by fear in every single case. So ask yourself, you know, what, what are you afraid of? What's the fears that you have? Why do you feel so guilty? Can you answer any of those questions? So you feel guilty that you are with your child that that you know you've done damage to your child, don't you? That's the feeling of guilt that you have. So why do you feel that? I just want to be a good parent and do the best that I can for him. Okay, so you actually feel you're a bad parent? Yeah. Okay. And now why would you feel like you're a bad parent, do you think? Don't go there because that's going to skip over. So you feel you're a bad parent. You want to feel that you're a good parent, but you feel you're a bad parent and that's why you feel guilty. How many of you feel like you've been a bad parent? Like, so how many of you still feel guilty about that? Yeah, quite a lot. So I, I was just processing guilt about it. Okay, okay. Sure. <laughs> yep, so this is a common emotion, right? So what's underneath the guilt? What do you think is underneath the guilt? You feel like you've been a bad parent. So, do you cry about that every day? I feel like I'm crying. I've got a bit crying. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, so you are actually crying about being a bad parent, aren't you? Okay. But it's not releasing anything. So it can't be a causal emotion. Does that make sense? I feel like I've been stuck in this. Before I even knew this yeah. stuff, I've been crying. Stuck in a cycle. For a long time. And I feel like I'm just driven. Or yeah. What will happen if you stop being a good parent? No, no. What would be the feelings other than guilt that you have? So let's say right today you stop being a quotation marks, and and your son started really yelling at you and how. What emotion would you feel besides him? Is there any other emotions you feel? Hurt. Hurt. What about? Yeah, no, no, no. Right. And now we're starting to get to your cause of emotion, believe it or not. So why do you do things for your son when he yells at you? So he's yelling at you is your law of attraction, right? Yes. So he's yelling at you. He yells at you to control you. Yes. And the best way anybody can be controlled is to make them feel guilty. So your son constantly makes you feel guilty. 
Now, sometimes he doesn't choose to make it, but now he's got it 13, he's now starting to choose to make you feel guilty. He knows that he can manipulate you with guilt. And I'm feeling really guilty right now, thinking that he didn't kill, and saying, I'm feeling really guilty. That's okay, that's okay. Just keep feeling guilty, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get deeper than the guilt, Dave. So, he's learned now that he can manipulate you with anger. You taught him this, actually. Yes, yeah. I know that. So, what are you afraid of from men? He's a male, and he's manipulating you with his anger. Can you see any patterns in this? Yes. What's the pattern? With your dad. Getting yelled at. Getting yelled at all the time with your dad. Yeah. And what did you feel you had to do when you got yelled at all the time with your dad? Didn't you feel like you had to do exactly what oh, dad said? You had to be a good girl. You had to be a good mum. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. You have to be a good girl, you have to be a good mum. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see the pattern of what's going on? So this is that this issue is actually about your dad yelling at you all the time to control you and you feeling that 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 was the, the only way you could earn love was to actually do what the person yelling at you wanted you to do. Yeah. And that's what your guilt is covering. Your guilt is covering that sadness. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. So the guilt is just a capping emotion, covering this deep sadness that you feel, grief that you feel, about having to do what Dad wanted when he yielded at you. And if you get into that, your law of attraction will change with your son. Right. Now, it's half past five. We've got a lot more to mention. Uh, yeah, I can mention that too. And Mary just said the difference between guilt and... Well, well you can mention that. Why don't I mention well, that? Because uh, I, was... <laughs> I, I think um, there's a difference between feeling guilty and um, self-punishing about our actions that may have caused soul damage to our children or someone else. Between Because that's a very um, static place. We just beat ourselves up and feel really terrible and, oh, we've done something wrong. Um, where in actual fact the more freeing thing, there will be some law of compensation as we open our soul emotionally, we'll, we'll feel and release that. But um, to get underneath that, I'm, I'm not sure I'm explaining it very well. But yes. the law of, remember the law of compensation is a result of you taking actions that are disharmonious with love and having a penalty upon your own soul. Right? And then there's a law of compensation effect. And remember I've also talked to you about how <coughs> repentance is the way past law of compensation. So when you feel deep feelings of sorrow in yourself for doing something uh, that was actually wrong in God's eyes and you've recognised it, then God's love or God's grace can come and you'll feel the change in you about that issue. You'll no longer cry about it. Now that's what I'd call a feeling of repentance. And the feeling of repentance is totally different than a feeling of guilt. Guilt is often imagined, and guilt is often created by childhood events. So what's happening with yourself, for example, is you're in this cycle of guilt. You can't get out of guilt. Guilt is a fear, and, and so you're in this cycle of fear, really, and you can't get out of it. That is not the same as the law of compensation, and that is not the same as repentance. Because true repentance results in immediate cleansing or immediate re response from God. Do you follow me? True repentance actually causes an immediate action upon the soul from God's love entering it. So therefore you won't cycle over guilt all over and over, over and over and over and over and over again. Guilt is something that covers a deeper emotion. And it usually is a deeper emotion we don't want to feel. And in your case, the emotion you don't want to feel is the emotion of how unloved you have been from your father. And instead of feeling that emotion, which is going to be quite a, like, it's going to have a lot of different parts to it when you feel it. Instead of feeling that emotion, you prefer guilt. Because guilt means you don't have to feel that emotion. Does that make sense? Guilt means you can try harder to not feel that emotion. And the, and the reason I cover it is because it's not You mean your dad was beautiful? Yeah, and so even though he yelled at me. 
Well, the truth is he did do something wrong to you. And the truth is he wasn't beautiful. Now, I know that sounds quite blunt, but a, but, a, but a parent who's yelling at a child constantly to control them is a very unloving parent. Now, they may think they're loving and they may look beautiful, but there's some major issues in the parent doing that to a child. So, so that is not loving and that's not beautiful. And you don't want to face that. You don't want to say that to yourself. Because if you say that to yourself, all of these emotions will be unlocked inside of you that you don't want to feel. And a very good uh, book to read um, as parents, but also uh, with children to read, is called Toxic Parents. Um, now, do you remember James who was a writer in that? You'll be able to find it on the net. It's called Toxic Parents, Healing the Shame of childhood something trauma or something like that but we'll bring the title along tomorrow with us but that book was written i think in the 60s or 70s by a by a woman who was very bluntly truthful it's a really good book to read because what it does is it exposes a lot of our false beliefs about parents being good or bad and uh, what actually connotate you know what actually is unloving behavior to a child and that's why it's such a good book to read. Um, it's a very confronting book if, you've dealt, if you have got sexual abuse issues or violent abuse issues in the family, you'll find it quite confronting. But it's a very good book to read. And what it does is it exposes the emotions behind why parents do things and, uh, and tries to break the definitions of whether mum has been good or bad um, and, and get down to it at an emotional level. So many of you want to hold on to a belief that your parents were good. The reason why you want to hold on to that belief is because inside of you, you have some emotions that will be unlocked if you no longer believe that. You see what I'm saying? So the addiction is, I want to believe mum and dad are good. I want to believe mum and dad were loving. I want to believe mum and dad were fantastic with me. I want to believe they did everything they could. I want to believe... And the reason why we want to believe all of these things is because underneath all of that is a lot of hurt that we felt when we were children. That if we don't believe those so-called truths that we've written in our mind, we will then start feeling these emotions. And if we do that, then we feel out of control. So we go into control, wanting to believe things about our parents that are not true. It's okay to say, my parent was abusive to me. My parent yelled at me. They might have stopped doing it. They might even be a great person now and they may be, even be sorry about it now. But that doesn't change the fact that it happened and I need to connect to that emotional. Does that make sense? And... <coughs> thanks. Ron. Uh, I just want to confirm what you said, AJ. It happened to me. I got treated um, before lunchtime, I went out in the car and had a ball. Yeah. Because I actually acknowledged how toxic my father had been to me. Yep. So I want to confirm it right now. Thank you. That's awesome. And that's the beauty. Uh, many of you are now starting to get into this process of as soon as you're triggered, going and processing the emotion, that's really, really good. Cool. So that's a very powerful thing for you to do. And uh, quite a number of you are now start doing that quite regularly. Just allow it to happen. If you do that then, you'll find that you won't have to try and access it later. It's a really frustrating process when it was right there, you could have dealt with it then, and then you detuned yourself, and then can you get back to it again? No, there has to be another trigger sometime down the track to get back to it. So that's a really good process. Again, if you look at what you learn from a child with that, a child does not wait to deal with their emotion. So a child often has more self-love than we do. So here we are thinking we're teaching our child self-love, right? In reality, our child's teaching us self-love, right? <laughs> because our child has self-love enough to actually feel its emotion in the instant that it's created. And that's where we need to be, in that same space. Okay. Uh, what you said before about, um, you know, saying that your mother and father weren't as good as you thought they were, and the thought came into my head that Maybe I'm blaming myself because I wasn't good enough. 
exactly. as the child. It's my fault that they weren't nice to me. Yes. This is a core emotion in most children, that when somebody treats them badly, they think it's their fault. You, and, and if you allow yourself to go down this track emotionally, you will actually find there's a lot of really good core emotions that you can release going down that track. The truth is that it's not your fault. There's been many times when I've been travelling overseas dealing with different people that the instant I've told them it's not their fault, they've burst out crying and dealt with something. But up until then they've argued that it was their fault constantly or they've blamed themselves constantly. Many of your emotions are locked up because you believe it was your fault when in reality it wasn't. It was created by someone outside of you. It's because we don't want to experience the one that we're on. Do you follow me? So, so let's say an emotion comes up firstly, oh, I'm a being a bad parent. Then all of a sudden I jump to, oh, I hate God. And then all of a sudden I jump to other emotions. What's actually happening is I'm trying to get away from the previous one all the time. And that's why another one comes up. But there's a soul longing that you want to do with your emotions. Right? So the best thing I've found for that myself is that what I try to do is just I allow whatever is triggered in that moment to be experienced in full. And as soon as some other interruption comes, even from my own mind, I always bring myself back to the same thing that I did right at the start. So I don't even go to the second discussion. Does that make sense? I don't even move. The first one was, the first one that came up today, this morning was whatever it was. Like, so I might have had a dream this morning. The first thing that came up this morning, I woke up and I was in fear. What was I afraid of? Well, the dream was about it was about the other day. Oh yeah, that's right. I had this piece of skin that just come off the back of my head, and I pulled it right off, and it was just like it was hard as a rock. The skin it was just, and I could hang it in front of myself, and then I dropped it, and then I went and grabbed another piece of skin off the back of my head and pulled it all the way up, and I woke up really freaked out right? <laughs> from this dream, and and I allowed myself to feel about it, you know, and just get straight into that now. Now, lots of other things could have happened during the day afterwards, but I need to focus, that was the thing that came up, so that's what I'm going to do with right now, and keep my focus on it. If I don't keep my focus on it, then there's a reason why, and the reason why is I don't want to. If I don't want to, then I need to be honest. I don't want to do with that. If you, if you don't be honest, you're going to jump from one to the other. Just say, like, the issue is, I'm a bad parent, if we bring up that previous issue. Or, you know, I feel guilty all the time. That's the issue, right? If I jump from that issue to another issue, it's because I don't want to deal with that first issue. So don't deal with the second one. Just go back to the first one. So I don't want to deal with that issue. And then when the second one comes up, no, the second one's there because I just don't want to deal with the first issue. You just keep reminding yourself. This, that's there because I don't want to deal with this issue. That's there because I don't want to deal with this issue. And what will happen is I'm allowed to not deal with issue, that issue, and as you start feeling that, ironically, you start connecting to the issue generally. It's, it's acknowledging that you don't want to that will enable you to stay on one place. At the moment, you're not acknowledging that you don't want to deal with that. So you go to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. 
And then you end up with this whole mental intellectual confused mess. And then you think, well, what in the hell? I can't do with anything now. Might as well go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's time to change, Dave, is it? One minute. I'm thinking uh, we probably won't add any more to this session because it's already 20 to 6. Uh, so we'll just we'll finish off there for the moment. I want to say a few things just after Peter turns off the camera though. So we might as well turn off the camera now.